Moondrop sent me their M4P to review. Now these retail for about 920 US dollars for the pair. They're monitor style speakers, which means they are meant to stand up as you'll see in this video coming up shortly. If you lay them down on their side, it's a bad day. So just don't do that at all. Before we get into the review, let's go ahead and start off with some basics. This is a two way four inch monitor speaker. Impedance suspect at four ohm weight is about 13 to 14 pounds or approximately 6.2 kilograms. Crossover spec at 1800 Hertz. Sensitivity spec at 85 decibels. Rated power input 75 Watts. Max power input 150 Watts. Woofer is two by four inch carbon cone woofers. And the tweeter is a one inch aluminum magnesium dome tweeter. They come in two different colors, matte white and matte black. These speakers are pretty small. Like, I mean, they're tall, but those little four inch mid woofers make them a pretty compact speaker overall. Now, I think that these are designed to be listened to mostly in the near field, but I did the majority of my listening from the far field, approximately 10 feet away or roughly about three meters. In my listening, I actually like the overall tonality of these speakers. Didn't have really any complaints. There were a couple little things here or there that kind of stood out, but some in a good and some in a bad way. So for example, in the bad way, it seemed like I noticed a touch of sibilance here or there, but in a good way, there was definitely noticeable bass thump to these speakers, more so than not only what I have just expected, but compared to my reference speaker, which is currently the Audio First Fidelia, which you see here, this speaker has a little bit more thump in it. Now, thump is typically going to be in like the 100 to 160 hertz region. And what it does is it gives a sense of deeper bass, but it's not necessarily deeper bass. It's just heightened mid bass. Usually the harmonics of a kick drum are going to show up in that region and give it a little bit more of a full sound. Now, preferentially, gosh, that's a weird word. I do like that extra little bit of a mid bass thump. I mean, I just, I genuinely like that in my own systems. I bump up that region a couple decibels to increase the overall sense of impact, if you will. So I like that while not technically accurate. The other thing that I like about the speaker is it's wide radiating soundstage. So when you play something like Thriller or I'll listen to anything from uh, Madonna's Immaculate Collection, which is done in Q sound, the soundstage is really, really wide and it almost sounds very enveloping. And those tracks really highlight some of the things I'm looking for in the stereo presentation. Now, if you want to listen to these in mono, which is best done when you're trying to understand the overall tonality of the speaker, then the things that you're gonna notice probably again are gonna be that heightened little bit of sibilance. And then the other thing, if you're comparing back to back with a speaker that maybe is more boosted in the top end, you're gonna notice that the top end on this speaker rolls off a little bit. Now, if you watch my recent video of the KEF Reference 2 Meta Center Channel, you're gonna notice that the estimated in-room response of these two speakers is pretty similar. I'm gonna point that out when I get to that section of the data in this review. But you'll also remember that I said something similar about the KEF having that little bit of a rolled off treble. Now, if you tend to like a speaker that has a little bit more brightness, a little bit more emphasis in the higher region where people would tend to call that resolution or detail, air quotes, okay, air quotes, because these things are subjective. Then what I tend to find is that you like a speaker that has a boosted treble, anywhere from two to maybe four or five decibels of boost in the high frequency region above about four kilohertz. Now, I do not like that. I don't like it. It's grating on my ears. It's bright. I don't like it. And I don't call it detailed or high resolution, but I understand that other reviewers are referring to that characteristic of the speaker when they use those subjective terms. So it's important for me to note and let you know what I'm talking about. So when I say it sounds like it's a little bit rolled off in the top end, it is rolled off from a linear response, which is already about one to two decibels down compared to a speaker that is two to five decibels of boost in that region, okay? So again, if you like a speaker that has more brightness to it, this probably isn't gonna fill your bucket for you, okay? In terms of the bass extension, it's pretty nice. It gets down to about 50 to 60 Hertz in room, but the key factor here is that it won't do it with a lot of volume. And that's the real limitation of this pair of speakers. 
As I said earlier, it is most likely intended to be listened to in the near field. Near field is typically considered within about a meter. Now it's gonna change depending on the speaker characteristics. If it's a really large speaker with multiple drivers, obviously the near field is gonna to need to be a little bit further away so all of those drivers can combine. In this case, one meter is an acceptable number for near field listening. And when you go further than that and you have to turn up the volume more, you're gonna introduce more distortion and really you're gonna introduce a lot more compression and lower dynamic range. And you'll see what I mean when we get to the data for this speaker. Now, the other con about this speaker is it's vertical radiation. It's really tight. You gotta be within about plus or minus 20 degrees of the tweeter axis. And ideally you're gonna be right on that tweeter axis. If you go above or below that, then it's gonna be a problem. Now, when you're sitting far away in the far field, again, maybe like you're sitting three meters, 10 feet or something like that, that angle isn't as big of a deal. I mean, you have to be sitting up quite a bit further than the tweeter level to hit 20 degrees or beyond. But when you're sitting in the near field, this right there, that difference right there, that can be the difference in exceeding that window. And what that really amounts to is that the upper frequency region, or the upper mid-range region, is gonna sound kind of dull, lifeless, lack of attack, lack of dialogue clarity, and some of those other subjective terms. On the flip side, and that's kind of a pun, but not really because if you take the speaker and you flip it over, but anyway, uh, if you're talking about just going to the side of the speaker, it's actually pretty wide. It's about plus or minus 60 degrees in overall radiation pattern. I like that. That's kind of like that sweet spot for me. That's where I want a speaker to be because it is wide enough that it includes the room and the reflections and gives a little bit more sense of ambiance, but it's not so wide that it really kind of sounds diffuse. And in a smaller room, the wider you go in radiation, the more diffusivity you can introduce uh, to the overall sound stage focus and imaging, all right? And if you don't know what those two terms mean, I did a video about that a few weeks ago. I encourage you to go check that out because I've got a lot of details in there. So overall, it's a good speaker, but it's just SPL limited. Now, how do I know this? Well, I've got a lot of data, but I also have ears, right? So as I turn the volume up, I'm like, oh, that dynamic range is not quite where it should be. Interestingly enough, the way that I noticed this, but didn't know for sure what it was until I looked at the data and then went back and did some further experimentation with my listening was the hand claps on Want to Be Starting Something by Michael Jackson. And listen, if you don't like Michael Jackson, that's fine. I, I do. That's what I use. Okay. Um, they sounded a little bit thin. So then I looked at the data and I was like, well, I'm listening about like 80 to 85 decibels at 10 feet away. Uh, you know, as you get closer to the speaker, that's louder and louder. So what I found was that in the data, the compression through that crossover region is pretty high. And so I went back and listened at lower volume levels and I thought, well, it sounds like it's, it's there. And then I turned the volume up and it sounds like it was kind of missing. Uh, all of that is to say that that could certainly be subjective to objective bias because I saw something in the data and then I went and listened for it and it was there, right? So, uh, you know, maybe I was hearing things, but it's also worthwhile to mention that it might be something that you would notice as well. What I'm gonna do now is give you a quick sound clip comparing original pink noise to the convolved response with this speaker's impulse response. And basically what I'm trying to do is show you the original pink noise and then this new version of pink noise that it takes into account the frequency response of the speaker on axis. It's not exactly what you're gonna hear in a room, but it gives you a good idea of the overall tonal balance of the speaker and how it affects the original recording. What did you hear? Would you say it's something like this, where we see the on-axis response pretty good. There's a bump in the four to eight kilohertz region, which can define some sibilance. And then there's a little bit of a trough in that lower mid-range and a little bit of a bump in the mid-bass compared to that mid-range. Did you hear that in the sound clips I just gave you? If you did, then good. The overall sensitivity of the speaker is around 85 decibels, F3 at 69 hertz, F10 at 46 hertz. So this speaker's down about three decibels at around 70 hertz and then down 10 decibels at around 46 hertz. This is the CEA 2034 data set. We can see that it looks pretty good. Same thing we just saw a second ago in black on axis response. 
And then we've got the directivity. Now the directivity shows a couple little issues. For one, there's this resonance right here. And then there's a dip in the directivity right through this three to four kilohertz region. And if I go down, this line gives you an idea of the linearity of the directivity. So we see a little bit of nonlinearity right in this region right there. So that could be the tinny cuppy region. And then the nonlinearity again in three to four kilohertz. Now this mismatch right here is gonna be due to the vertical lobing of this particular speaker. What do I mean when I say vertical lobing? Well, it's just when those two midwoofers above and below that tweeter start playing the same information and essentially they just cancel out, that creates a lobe or a notched in response. I'm gonna show you what that means shortly. This is the estimated interim response and this line indicates pretty much how I heard the speaker. Now the main takeaway for me the biggest thing that I heard about the speaker that I enjoyed the heck out of was this bass bump right here. It's a good two to three decibels above the mid-range, and I like that. So I didn't particularly hear the mid-range dip in this particular speaker, but I heard that mid-bass bump. You may hear the opposite. You may not hear the mid-bass bump as much as you notice the dip in the mid-range. And these things are all relative, so that's why I'm letting you know how I heard the speaker. There's this mild upper mid-range dip that could sound recessed or warm. And then again, there's this higher frequency roll off. Even when you point the speaker directly at you, you're gonna have about two to three decibels of higher frequency roll off here. But the overall matching between the speaker at zero degrees pointing directly at you, and then 30 degrees towed out, maybe facing out into the room is pretty similar. So you're gonna have the same tonal balance between seats if you move between seats, if you need to. I talked about the match between the Kef Reference 2 Meta and this speaker. So what I did was, because honestly, when I was looking at the estimated interim response, I thought, did I grab the wrong graphic? Did I just mislabel this Moondrop and it's really the Kef? So I went and looked at the Kef, I plotted them in REW, and then I lined up the mid-range. So the Kef is in blue, the Moondrop is in red. Lining up the mid-range shows us that the Moondrop has a higher bass boost. Well, I've already talked about that. And then they both have this similar dip through the one kilohertz region, though the moon drop is more narrow. The moon drop peaks up again around three to four kilohertz and kind of has an overall higher treble. Now this comparison would lead you to find most likely that the moon drop sounds a little bit more bright overall, maybe a little bit more detailed if you want to use that word. Whereas you might describe the KF as a little bit more dark between the two. Now, I don't mean to say that you can compare the Moondrop to the Kef because the Kef is a different animal. The Kef has much higher SPL capability and much lower distortion. Burst Decay shows there is some stored energy around 20K, this tweeter most likely. The horizontal contour plot shows the speaker is at about plus or minus 60 degrees through the mid range. And then even when it starts to narrow up through the tweeter, it's still relatively wide at about plus or minus 50 degrees. So wide soundstage. Vertical, within about plus or minus 20 degrees, you're okay. But when I talked earlier about the lobing, basically what you've got is the reference axis, this is zero degrees, this is where the tweeter would be, right through this line dead in the middle. And then the midwoofer and the midwoofer above and below that. As those midwoofers start to play the same frequency range, they start to cancel each other out. And that's where you wind up with this notch through here. And then the tweeter comes in at around two kilohertz or so. And then that's when you get more energy flared out above and below that tweeter axis up into the midwoofer areas, okay? So basically this just means that these two guys on the top and bottom are canceling out through the mid range and then the tweeter comes in and those cancellations go away because the mid ranges aren't really playing as much anymore. And that also means that if you sit above or below that tweeter axis, then you're gonna hear less and less of that mid range, that upper mid range, and it's gonna sound more uh, lack of detail, lack of attack, those kind of aspects. Harmonic distortion at 86 decibels, it looks okay. And then at 96 decibels, all right, this is where we see things really start to jump the shark here. Now I will point out that the distortion is primarily made up of second order distortion. So while it is high, it's second order, so it's less problematic in terms of audibility. Multitone distortion, this thing is riding right at about that 3% level. And then if you use a subwoofer, it doesn't really change much. Now, what about long-term compression? So this speaker shows that with multitone tones for about 30 seconds at 70, 78, 88, and then 96 decibels, which is each of these steps, these blue is 70, and then this is 78, 
88, 96 decibels. Uh, as you turn the volume up, you're getting more compression and you're also getting more distortion through this region right here. So if you try to go up to 96 decibels for pink noise or any kind of like higher level output longer term, uh, yeah, you're gonna experience about what, two to three decibels of distortion and compression. And then what about instantaneous, okay? That's where this comes in. This is not good. And this indicates that you have about one and a half decibels of compression, so you're losing that dynamic range and then you have about three decibels of enhancement due to added distortion. Impedance, okay, minimum impedance is about 3.7 ohm. Minimum EPDR is about 1.7 ohm. So for longer term listening, uh, you're gonna wanna be mindful of listening to this with an AB amplifier just because of the heat capacity. Uh, if you're listening with a class D amplifier, you're gonna have a little bit more room because they are a little bit more, or typically are uh, more, thermally efficient, okay? And then that does it for this review. Overall, I do like the speaker. It's SPL limited, tonality is good. I like the nice mid-bass thump. It's got a little bit of a sibilance boost on the top end, and then it rolls off pretty quickly. So those are aspects that you may not like, but it does actually sound really good. So if you use these for the near field, I definitely recommend it for far field listening. That's a little bit more of a gamble because you start to lose a lot of the uh, dynamic range of the speaker. So just keep that in mind. If you like what you see here and you appreciate these kind of reviews, please let me know by leaving me a comment in the section below. Leave me a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. That definitely helps me spread kind of, you know, what I'm doing here. Uh, this is not my day job. I work a day job. I just do this on the side because I'm super passionate about it. And I love this stuff. I've been doing it for almost two decades at this point. It's just, it's my, it's my thing. I love this stuff. Um, if you would like to support me in other ways, you can join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. And I post behind the scenes info, early updates, uh, early data, ask questions, take messages, do consulting there and things of that nature. You can buy merch via the merch store link below. And then you can also use any of my generic affiliate links, take you to Crutchfield, Amazon, Best Buy, Walmart, Target, whatever. It doesn't matter what you want to buy. Just click that link before you buy it. So for example, if you want to buy something tomorrow and you, I don't know, let's say you want a treadmill from Walmart. You remember, Aaron's got a, a generic affiliate link. I'm going to click that link and then I'll go buy that treadmill, okay? That stuff helps me out a lot and it doesn't cost you anything extra and I really appreciate it. I will talk to y'all later. Take care. Peace.